Hello. Um, it's been a long time since we read any of our story with half term. So um, we're on chapter 15 of Barnaby Brockett. Uh, let's see if we can remember what happened before. Ah, um, we were going to find out um, what has happened to Charles, who was the man that Barnaby was traveling on the train with. Um, he was the man from the gallery, wasn't he? So, and he's got scars on his face. We're going to find out why that was. Um, so, uh, chapter 15 is called um, A Fire in the Studio. Darkness began to fall on the landscape outside and some of the people in the carriage turned on the tiny spotlights above their heads in order to continue reading or turn them off in an attempt to get some sleep. I was only a boy when the terrible thing that happened to me took place, said Charles, speaking quietly now as he thought about the past. Only eight years old. I'm eight years old now, said Barnaby. Well then, perhaps you'll understand how I felt. My mother, who you saw in the newspaper, ran a photography studio from our home in Brooklyn. She had the top floor of the house and the middle floor was where my parents, Eva and I, lived. Uh, the ground floor was where my father designed his collections. Both my parents were very busy people. It often felt like they were at the heart of everything that went on in the city. They only associated with the most beautiful people. People liked them, models with perfect faces, movie stars and cultural icons. Their version of normal, no one else's. Famous actors, musicians, novelists, Artists, they all came through our home on a daily basis and only occasionally did either of my parents even notice that Eva and I lived there too. Is your sister older than you? asked Barnaby. No, a few years younger. She's almost 30 now, hence the look of dread on her face in that photograph. Anyway, a few weeks before my ninth birthday, I found myself alone in the house. This almost never happened as it was more the centre of a very particular universe than a family home. And I thought I'd do a little exploring. So I went upstairs to my mother's studio and started looking through the contact sheets because I knew she had lots of photographs of models with their clothes off. And I was starting to get very interested in photos of models with their clothes off. Barnaby sniggered to himself and as he did so, one of the attendants came through the carriage carrying a large basket of treats and crying pretzels, pretzels, very loudly in a sing-song voice, waking half the passengers. When she reached Charles, she did a double take and moved quickly past him, even though Barnaby would have quite liked some pretzels. He was starting to realise just how rude some people could be when they were confronted with someone who looked a bit different. Anyway, there's a lot of equipment in a photography studio, continued Charles, who gave the impression that he hadn't noticed the snub, even though Barnaby was certain he had. An extraordinary number of liquids and potions, toners, developing fluids, things like that. I was doing things I shouldn't have been doing, of course, and disaster was bound to strike. I knocked over a lamp, which fell onto a pile of film stock, and before I knew what was happening, the whole room was ablaze. Barnaby gave a gasp and put his hand over his mouth. He remembered how terrifying it had been when the classroom at the Graveling Academy for Unwanted Children had caught fire. He had thought he was going to die, and he would have too if it hadn't been for the bravery of Liam McGonagall and his pincer hooks. For weeks afterwards, he'd had nightmares about being trapped by fire and not being able to float above it. Everything after that is a little too is a little hard to remember, said Charles. After a few moments looking down at his lap, rather than directly at Barnaby, as he thought about that afternoon 25 years before. The whole house went up quite quickly, I was told, but somehow one of the firefighters managed to get me out. When I woke up, I find my, found myself in a hospital in the burns unit, and this awful gel was spread all over my face. My skin was burning intensely beneath the ointment and I was covered with a thick layer of bandages. It was the most excruciating agony. Weeks later, when I could finally sit up and see myself in the mirror, I looked like a mummy from ancient Egypt. It was awful. For a boy of my age, it felt like the end of the world. Although Barnaby thought about the mummies he'd read about in history 
class and tried to imagine what it would be like to be wrapped up like that. He wasn't able to. I was in hospital for months and when they took the bandages off, I looked even worse than I do now as the scars were still spreading and hadn't fully settled down yet. Even the nurses couldn't bear to look at me and they were used to dealing with burns victims. So there were operations, operations, endless operations. I turned nine years old on the ward and as I was growing, the skin on my face started to stretch too and, and my face only became worse. My parents, who had always set so much store by physical beauty, well, they simply couldn't believe what their son looked like now. I started to realize that while at first they had come to visit me every day, their visits had began to grow less frequent. And soon I was only seeing them once a week. Then they began to take it in turns to come. My mother would say that my father had a collection to deliver, or my father would say that my mother was spending the day taking photographs of a group of film stars, eating lunch together and comparing hairstyles. Eva never came, except once when she screamed so loudly that she had to be taken away before she upset the other patients. Then the visits dwindled at once to once a month. Then they were replaced by phone calls. Then I got the occasional letter and finally I stopped hearing from them altogether. That's terrible, said Barnaby. I wasn't one of them anymore, you see, continued Charles. I was too different. The hospital relocated me to a children's residential home and it was as if my family had decided that I didn't exist. And so the morning I turned 16, I got up early, packed a bag and moved to Canada. I started a new life there with people who saw who I was on the inside rather than this burned creature on the outside. I made a life for myself and when I started to gain recognition in circles my family moved in, that's when they got back in touch. Last year, they even started talking about me in interviews, but I don't speak to them. I won't take their calls. I don't reply to their letters, and I certainly won't let them friend me or whatever it is people do on their computers these days, however much effort they make. Barnaby glanced at the photograph of the model once again, and it was true. She was very beautiful, but she looked miserable as if there was something missing in her life. And when he turned the page to see the picture of Mr. and Mrs. Etheridge, they were deep in conversation with the head of the United Nations, but there was an unhappy expression on their faces too. How did you survive in Canada? Asked Barnaby, who suddenly felt very far from home and completely alone. If you didn't know anyone, I mean, Sometimes there are lucky moments in life, replied Charles, looking out of the window now and smiling at a happy memory, stronger than those sad ones. I saw an advertisement for a room to rent in the city and for the next five or six years, ended up living in the home of a wonderful Spanish couple who ran a veterinary practice from an office attached to their house. They had no children of their own and treated me like a son. They didn't care what I looked like, didn't mind that I was different. Why, if someone stared at me in the street, they would fly into a rage to defend me. They were good people. But look, we should get some sleep. It's getting late and we have a few hours to go yet. Are you tired? I am actually, said Barnaby. We'll close your eyes and when you wake up, you'll be in Toronto, the most magnificent city in the world. Actually, that's Sydney, said Barnaby, feeling sleep begin to arrive already. But it's a common mistake. The train pulled into the station early the following morning and Charles and Barnaby woke up looking around with sleepy eyes as the conductor called out, Toronto, last stop. Better put this on, said Charles, reaching up to the overhead rack for Barnaby's iron-weighted rucksack and helping him to put it on. They ignored Betty Ann and her mother as they stepped off the train and made their way through the station and out onto the busy street, pleased to be able to stretch their legs again. We'll hail you a taxi. All you have to do is ask for the international airport, said Charles. Here's your ticket. It's a long flight, I'm afraid, but at least you'll be on your way home. I don't mind, said Barnaby, as long as I get there. I'm curious, said Charles, taking the boy aside and sitting down next to him on a bench. I know what your parents did to you, and yet you still want to go home. Of course I do, said Barnaby. But why, when they sent you away like they did? Because they're my family, said Barnaby with a shrug. But they didn't want you. But they're still my family, repeated Barnaby, as if this was the most obvious thing in the world. And it's not like I'm ever going to have another mum and dad, is it? 
Charles nodded and thought about this. And what if they send you away again, he asked, and Barnaby frowned. I don't know, he said. I haven't thought that far ahead. All I do know is that they're in Sydney and no matter what they did to me, I still want to go home. Maybe they'll tell me they're, st they're sorry and maybe they'll even mean it. If they do that much, well, then that will probably be enough for me. Everyone makes mistakes, don't they? Charles smiled, but was unable to argue with the boy's simple logic. All right, then, he said, standing up. Let's get you into that taxi. He put his hand in the air and one pulled over almost immediately. Barnaby jumped in. Thanks again, he said. You're welcome. Have a safe flight home. The taxi drove off and Barnaby looked around, expecting to see Charles making his way towards his office. But to his surprise, his friend had sat down again and was looking at his mobile phone. His fingers hovered over it for a long time before he seemed to make a decision and started dialing a number. Barnaby smiled and turned around again, sure that Charles and his family would soon be reunited, just like he would be with his. And it was at that moment that his heart skipped a little beat as he realised that he had his rucksack, he had his iron weights, he had his plane ticket. But there was one very important thing that he didn't have, which he would most certainly need for, his, for this taxi driver. I don't have any money, he said aloud. And a moment later, the taxi had pulled into the curb, the back door was opened, and Barnaby Brockett was promptly pushed out onto an unfamiliar Canadian street. Oh dear. So now he's in Canada with no money on his own. Right. More next time.